So hello, it is a pleasure to be here today. My name is Marcel Lamont Walker. Uh, I am coming to you today from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the United States, and I work for the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. I'm a project manager and a lead project artist, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the project that I work on here in just a moment. Uh, but again, I want to thank you all for taking time out of your day or evening, depending on where you're coming from, uh, to join me here today so I can tell you about this. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Holocaust Center, where, where I work at, the work that we do there, and a little bit about myself as a lead in to the main topic of discussion today, which is uh, our publication, Hutzpow. So give me one moment, please. I will be sharing my screen here. Let's see. Make sure that this works okay. Can everyone see this okay? Okay, good. All right. Let me just find where my notes are at for this. Please excuse me. Uh, let's see. Beg your pardon, it's taking just one moment. I'm sorry, I'm actually going to stop presentation just for one moment so I can pull up my notes. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me, a lot going on here. Okay. So the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh uh, connects the horrors of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism with injustices of today. Through education, the Holocaust Center seeks to address these injustices and empower individuals to build a more civil and humane society. Especially during these trying times, we rely on our amazing staff, led by our director, Lauren Barron's father, PhD, to provide one another with knowledgeable information all the time. We're a small but mighty group and we accomplish a lot with what we have to give. While current access to the exhibits in our public gallery, as well as our extensive library and archive have been restricted due to the pandemic, we've continued remotely by offering a host of resources for educators, students, and the general public such as engaging virtual cultural events with renowned national and international speakers, digital resources, services, and art exhibits. Uh, through the Light Education Initiative, Leadership Through Innovation in Genocide and Human Rights Teaching, uh, this was developed by Pittsburgh area educator Nick Haberman, we foster supportive networking opportunities and make available free and affordable resources for teachers. This includes our original comic book publication, Hutzpow, Superheroes of the Holocaust. Uh, an archive of our online programs can be found on our YouTube channel. In response to community voices of survivors and their families, we offer our Generations Legacy Group, which features book talks, guest speakers and lecturers, and other social events. Through regional and national partnerships, including live theater offerings, uh, butterfly project grants, and more, we challenge the community to embrace inclusion and to fight against bigotry and intolerance happening in the world today. So Hutzpow is an original anthology comic book publication of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. Each issue tells the true stories of Holocaust survivors and heroes drawn from their individual narratives by professional comic book creators and vetted by the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh for historical accuracy. To date, four issues have been produced, each with a unique unifying theme, and they are supported by the Hutzpow Teachers Resource Guide. So this is what I work on predominantly at the Holocaust Center. And this is what I'm glad to be here to talk to you about today. So as I lean into and you're going to learn a little bit about comics history as well. Uh, and to that end, I'm going to begin with an acknowledgement of comics history of non inclusivity and misrepresentation. So the presentation you're about to watch draws from the rich history of comic books. Now you often don't see many women people of color or other underrepresented groups discussed because they typically weren't allowed to participate in the medium, especially during its primacy. Understand that they've always been present as creators and readers in unheralded and often important roles which continue to come to light. I encourage you to seek out information about the people and characters whose experiences aren't reflected here today. Their contributions were every bit as valuable. As we talk today, today I'm going to tell you about Hutzpah and the, the comic book we self-publish at the Holocaust Center. Uh, and then I'm going to walk you through an actual Hutzpah story. 
Uh, and then finally show you how it's been implemented in some of our partner educators classrooms. I'm sure some of you out there are educators, so it's, it's a chance for me to show you what we have available for you. Um, it's my goal today to help you all become more comfortably knowledgeable about comics so you can most effectively incorporate them into your teaching or teaching in areas where you are at. To that end, there are three basic tenets that'll serve as the framework for this presentation. So comic books have always been for everyone, comic books are literature, and comics foster communication through engagement. It's very important that we remember these three things, and I will be reinforcing these themes as we go along. Um, so we're going to jump back for a bit here to, to closer to the origins of comics. Now, they originated in the early, in the, excuse me, the mid-1930s, and very quickly took hold of the, the public's imagination. Uh, readership was very, very high. There's a, pre, there's a preconception now, a misbelief that comics are for kids and that they've always been for kids, but nothing could be farther from the truth. Comics are for everyone and they always have been. Uh, the founding fathers of American comics primarily hailed from Jewish backgrounds. And as such, they were very plugged into what was unfolding in Europe prior to and during World War II. Numerous comic book creators, uh, including Will Eisner, Nick Cardi, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, these were very, very important figures in American comics, joined the rank and file of the U.S. military at the same time as their handiwork, their comics, made it into the hands of millions of troops overseas. Uh, at military post exchanges, comic books outsold standard fare, such as Life Magazine and Reader's Digest by as much as 10 copies to one. Some comics were even produced with cooperation of the US military to boost the war effort. What you're looking at here now are two photos from around that time. And I had to pick just a few photos. There are many I could have shown you, but I like these two uh, to demonstrate some the, the width of comics readership, the breadth of comics readership. So we are looking at a sailor aboard the USS Duran in 1942, and we're looking at uh, military officers at the Battle of the Bulge in 1945. Regularly, uh, military personnel were sent comics and purchased comics to read overseas. This was very easy material for them to carry and to read, and it kept them entertained and informed about life back here in the States. Uh, and there were millions of readers, that can't be overstated, of all ages and backgrounds here in the States. The photos you're looking at now demonstrate just some of the breadth of comics popularity from coast to coast. Again, there were many photographs I wanted to share with you, but I had to keep it simple. Um, the subject matter was just as diverse as that found in movies or on radio and in books. Comic books were not just for kids, but the majority of kids did read comics. That's an important distinction. So you're looking at uh, some young detainees, <clears throat> excuse me, at the Tool Lake Relocation Center in Newell, California in 1942. So these are Japanese interns here in the States during World War II. Uh, at the bottom, there's a boy in New York, New York at the Children's Colony School for Refugee Children. He's reading an issue of Superman. That touched a string with me, uh, that touched my heart for reasons you're gonna find out in just a moment. And we have a picture of a young girl at a Pittsburgh newsstand here in Pittsburgh reading a copy of a comic called Submarine Pirates. That was taken by renowned photographer, Teeny Harris, a very renowned photographer here locally uh, in 1947. And this is just, again, represents some of the range of comics audience at this time. Most kids read comics. Uh, after the war, as superheroes diminished in popularity, other genres continued to thrive. So you had pretty much every drama, every drama, genre in comics that you can think of mystery comics and romance comics and military comics and police comics they all coexisted but dr frederick wordham authored a book called seduction of the innocent which was a biased study of the effect of comic books on american youth and testified to this at senate subcommittee hearing on juvenile delinquency now this took place in 1954 uh, and there's a photo from the hearings right there. Frederick Wordham was convinced that comic books contributed directly and even caused juvenile delinquency because in his experience, all juvenile delinquents read comics. So therefore they were at fault. 
he was wrong, however, because it was simply all most kids read comics. So it stood to reason that children with problems would read comics. But his misinterpretation gained a lot of traction, <clears throat> uh, a lot of notoriety. These hearings were held. And while no official action was taken, in reaction to the negative public response to how comics were now being portrayed and to avoid government regulation, comic book publishers themselves enacted the Comics Code Authority, which was a self-governed body of censors. Uh, their changes to the industry, which resulted in the canceling of more mature titles, the dumbing down of what remained with highly policed subject matter, led to the shift in public perceptions of comics, which has lingered to the present day. So if you ever hear somebody say that comics are for kids or comics are, or, or juvenile material, which they can be, but they are not inherently juvenile. They were created as a disposable means of entertainment but and communication, but not to be inherently juvenile. But this is where that misperception started. And so that's important to remember moving forward. They've always been for everybody and they've been just as valid as every other means of communication. Now, if we're gonna talk about comics as literature, Within just three years of the publication of Wordham's book, Seduction of the Innocent, came the publication of The Montgomery Story. Uh, this was published in December of 1957, and it was in many respects what I consider to be the most important comic book in American history. Uh, its instructional nature paved the way for comics to be utilized for education and as a force for social good. This comic book told the story of Martin Luther King, Jr. and the Mo Montgomery bus boycotts at the dawning of the modern civil rights movement. It was incredibly influential. This comic book was created not just to tell that story, but also as an instruction manual for others participating in the movement and like movements. Uh, it actually saved lives, which I think very few books of any type can attest to. Uh, it's been reprinted since. It's been made available internationally. It truly is, as I see it, one of the most, if not the most important comic book that has ever been published. And the fact that it was produced in such a short time frame after the publication of Wordham's book goes to show that he, he was wrong in his perceptions of this medium. And I don't know if he ever came across this book, but I really wish he had because it disproved everything that he was talking about. So those are important milestones in the history of comics. Now I'm gonna jump forward a little bit and tell you about myself. Um, my title is the Hutzpah Project Coordinator, which means I have primary oversight of the Holocaust Center's self-published educational comic book, Hutzpah. I'm primarily a content creator. I'm an artist and I'm a writer. And I facilitate communication and factual information about the Holocaust as the resident comic book authority. Uh, I didn't start out in this role though. I, my relationship with the Holocaust Center began with me working as a freelance, what I call graphic prose artist, otherwise known as comic books, uh, here in sunny Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I've been reading comics my entire life. So I was introduced to comics when I was five or six years old. That's a picture of me from back then. Uh, from the beginning, they provide an escape from family hardships. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote an essay titled A Steady Stream of Stars which goes into my, my background and how I fell in love with comics and how they were introduced to me. From the beginning, I've always been captivated by Superman. Now I've grown up with Superman slash Clark Kent slash Kal-El in my soul. And he's taught me as much as any person I've known. These are just a few of the comics I owned when I was a child, but I'd like to focus on this one in particular. Now this is action comics, number 500. This is all leading into <laughs> the main feature here. Um, in this story, Superman leads a tour group of admirers through an exhibit dedicated to his life. Now, he, he allows them a clear glimpse in his background. And when I revisited the story just a few years ago, it made me think of the work we do at the Holocaust Center with Holocaust survivors and the people who we connect to them. When I was a child, learning about Superman's story primed me to learn about far more mature and real world themes than I could have realized. Uh, that definitely happened in with this story here, though I didn't realize it at the time. Uh, as mentioned before, Superman is asked to relate his earliest memories to a group of admirers, which includes the destruction of his home world. So he does so because Superman has learned to channel his trauma 
to hone his empathy for others. Uh, through this sequence here, we, where he is regressed to a childlike state, readers get a peek at the sensibilities of children and how they process the trauma of what they personally endure. What's asked of Superman in this sequence is similar to what's asked of survivors and their narratives, where we ask them to describe the unthinkable so we can learn. So right here, the most powerful person in the galaxy is reduced to tears by his painful memories of those he lost. I had a base understanding of this as a child because of my own experiences. I understood it in full as an adult once I better understand what loss entailed. So comics as literature can help us process trauma as well as develop empathy for others' experiences if we're mindful and selective about the books and material we choose to read. Uh, many of our most well-known superheroes have undergone traumatic events. And because of what I'd lived through as a child, I had an understanding of the harsher elements of Superman's history. So even if a person hasn't had direct trauma in their youth, and hopefully most people haven't, they can learn that how people deal with trauma, traumas defines their heroism because comics have always been for everyone. Comics are literature and comics foster communication through engagement. This makes them an ideal tool for such learning, both as readers and as creators. So I use Superman as a gateway into the world of comics because he was a gateway for me. Now I wanna talk about some comics that directly address the Holocaust. Um, and you can't do that unless you talk about Mouse. Uh, which was written and drawn by Art Spiegelman. This was first collected uh, as a volume, as a single volume and published in 1986. Um, it's the first graphic prose work to win a Pulitzer Prize for special work. Uh, and that happened in 1992. Part of the shift back towards comics, excuse me, back towards respect for comics art. This was a part of that. And it also helped processing trauma through literature as a memoir. This book is still, and it, this is the volume one and volume two, um, Mouse is still the gold standard for graphic prose that reflects on the Holocaust. Whenever anybody hears about our project Hutzpah, they always talk about Mouse. But there are at least three, in my experience, excuse me, there have been three books that are typically uh, referenced when we're talking about literature in, in educational settings. Uh, those books are Mouse, the Diary of Anne Frank, and Night by Eli Wiesel. Um, when, when introduced to the events of the actual Holocaust, most of us from non-Jewish cultures are typically given these works, these notable works in school settings. Uh, they're the standard reading materials and related curriculums. We know of them even if we haven't read them. My own scarce familiarity with the details of the Holocaust uh, still allow for me to know of these books. But because these were memoirs, they weren't created with scholastic applications in mind. They weren't designed to be used in schools. Um, in the Pittsburgh region, there have been other local memoirs uh, produced by regional survivors and their families, which, and many of their uh, stories have been shared with the Holocaust Center, and they've been doing so for decades now. And in their doing so, they, the survivors have shouldered a burden much like real life superheroes. Uh, what you're looking at is the cover of a book, the book Flares of Memory, which was published by the Holocaust Center. Um, and these are some of the people whose stories are detailed in there and some of them have written their own memoirs. So Dora Eiler, uh, Malke and Mache Baron, their stories are in Flares of Memory. Uh, Fritz Ottenheimer wrote his own book, Escape and Return, uh, which detailed his story and Les Banos also wrote his own book. If they catch you, you will die. Uh, so these are regional memoirs, which did much the same work as, uh, as Mouse and Knight and uh, the Diary of Anne Frank, capturing these stories for audiences to learn about these experiences. But in the fall of 2013, a steering committee at the Holocaust Center began discussing ways to be more intentional with these stories as instructional narratives. Uh, it was decided, let's see, um, excuse me, uh, we, it was decided to create some new content which could be used uh, for, for, by educators to discuss the Holocaust in a new context. Uh, 
the comic book that we created, which you're looking at the cover of the first issue right there, it's bound number one. Uh, it focused on five key local figures who we called upstanders who had share, already shared their experiences either through lectures, presentations, uh, written, written testimony or verbal interviews. At the time, two survivors were still with us. Uh, the Holocaust Center contacted the, those survivors and their families to get their approval for the project, which they gave, uh, but with some hesitancy at some point because the misperception of comic books as juvenile material still lingers. The, so two goals were decided upon early on, uh, both to utilize comic book artwork with a biographical application. So not so much, not so strictly as a memoir, but rather for scholastic use and to reframe the perception of Holocaust survivors as being solely victims to being heroic and at times super heroic. So it was decided to create a traveling exhibit and a companion comic book. Each was intended to have scholastic and general audiences. So these were very lofty goals. Um, the exhibit focused on international heroes whose stories had higher recognition. These subjects were revisited at length later on in volume two, International Heroes. So you're seeing side by side a picture of, uh, of some of the panels from our art exhibit, which debuted in the summer of 2014. And that's the cover of Hutzpah volume one, uh, which debuted just a little bit later in August of 2014. And it's actually on a, on a comic book rack. So that's, that's actually showing it in a comic book store here locally. Um, when we first approached the survivors with the idea of doing Hood's Bow, uh, not all of them were into the idea at first uh, because they, those lingering misperceptions of comics as juvenile still lingered. But once they got to see it, they mo almost all became staunch supporters of the project. Uh, this is Fritz Ottenheimer, and this photo here is when he got to first see Hutzpah. So this is him looking at one of the very first issues off the presses of the book. So he got to finally see what we were doing, and he was wonderful. He gave us language about the project that we use to this day. Uh, he was interviewed personally for his story, which appears in that first issue of Hutzpah, and he was quoted as saying, when you're acting as a Superman, you're teaching your children to be Supermen. And getting his endorsement for this project meant a lot because it meant that we did something right and they could understand the value in what we were attempting to do. It's worth emphasizing, I want to kind of revisit this, that Mouse was created as a personal memoir of the author's family and was done so adeptly that it was eventually adopted for scholastic use with teachers and in school settings. Hutzpah inverted this approach and instead was created with the scholastic application in mind from the outset. Now, other differences include Mouse was a sustained narrative. It's a, it's a, it's a novel. Uh, while Hutzpah stories are much more succinct, they average about six pages each. There are multiple stories per issue. So it's an, also an anthology comic book. Uh, and Mouse also utilized, for those of you who are familiar with this, you already know, utilized iconography and symbolism. So. Jews were depicted as mice and Germans were depicted as cats and so on and so on. Um, while Hutzpah has always taken a more naturalistic approach to its storytelling. Like, in short, people and events are depicted as close to how they appeared as possible. So we took a very different approach with how we chose to, uh, to, to produce Hutzpah. Now that is not, not saying anything against Mouse, which is still a landmark work, but we just chose to go in a very different route because we really wanted teachers to be able to use our materials as readily as possible. Each issue, and we produce four to date, has a different theme. Uh, while the series as a whole explores resistance, resilience, and identity, uh, volume one, The Upstanders, kind of gives an overview of the Holocaust and different different perspectives that we're going to, uh, we would, we would then follow up on. Volume two, International Heroes, focuses on people whose stories had a wider audience. So volume one, I should also mention, focused on stories of people from here in Pittsburgh. Volume two took a broader lens. Volume three, the young survivors told the stories of people who were children during the Holocaust. And again, we pulled in our focus here locally to people who uh, ended up here in Pittsburgh. And volume four, our most recent volume, 
focuses on women's stories and their unique experiences during the Holocaust. And our lens goes back out a little bit. So we've, we've tried to accommodate different types of stories here. Um, in classrooms, Hutzpah can be used in at least five different ways, supporting history lessons, supporting visual arts, supporting language and narrative arts, supporting journalism and documenting history as it unfolds, and as a direct instructive aid. So how to think and act during times of crisis, which also supports mental health. Uh, the micro histories of each story together form a macro history of the Holocaust and its aftermath. This is, uh, excuse me, the Holocaust Center's focus on inclusion in, extends to the creative team, which yields many lenses through which to view the big picture of the Holocaust. Um, this is Wayne Wise, our lead project writer. He's been involved with the project since the very beginning. And these are pictures of some of our most recent creators, a few of whom have been involved with Hutzpah since the very beginning, others who are brand new to the project, and some of whom were even brand new to comics. Um, we take a lot of effort to make sure that the creators on this comic book come from as many diverse backgrounds as possible, because we found it's important to you have as many lenses on these stories as possible. We view these stories as stories that everybody should have access to. And in order to do that, we want as many different kinds of creators involved as possible. And I can also vouch with, for these folks, they are wonderful people. So they are fantastically talented writers and artists, and they are just really wonderful, empathetic people who really identify with the material and take a lot of time and trouble and effort to bring it vividly to life. This is some artwork from the pages of our most recent issue, Women's Stories, um, that tells diff so different art from different artists that tells different people's stories. Uh, from left to right, we have story of Hetty Sternad as told by writer Bertie Willis and artist Vince Dorsey. We have a page of story from the story of Noor Inyat Khan by Yo writer Yona Harvey and artist Yang Zen Li. Uh, we have a page from the story of Simone Vale by writer Louis Brom and artist Mark Zingarelli. And lastly, we have a page of the story from about Margaret Bergman as written by Wayne Wise and illustrated by artist Erica Chan. The variety of artwork that we get with Hood's Pal is it, it is, while it is always clear and is always naturalistic, the variety of artwork is always surprising even to me and I am a comics creator myself. So I also always contribute to Hood's Pal. I, as I said earlier, I'm the lead project artist. Uh, so what I'm going to share with you next is an actual Hood's Pal story. So this is from volume one. And this tells the stories of Mache Baran and Malka Baran who met and married immediately after the Holocaust. Uh, the story is called Parallel Choices. It was scripted by Wayne Wise. It was drawn by me. And I, I'm going to talk you through it. So I'm not going to literally read it line per line, but I want to kind of talk you through it and so you can understand like what happens and just how it gets utilized. So in this story, we chose to frame it with them in the present tense. Uh, so you see Mache Barn and you see his wife, Malka Barn. They're each at podiums. They're about to tell their respective stories. Uh, both of them growing up in their villages in Poland during the Holocaust. And both of them started out with relatively normal and happy uh, childhoods and backgrounds. <clears throat> and then we flash back and we have them narrating their own stories as they did in real life. So they actually did do this and we chose to depict them doing what they did in real life, which is telling people their story. So here we see Mache telling the how Nazis came to his village in 1939. Uh, they came in trucks with men and their world collapsed. Then we see Malka telling a similar story, how when she was 15, uh, Nazis came and they awoke her family. Uh, they began rounding up people in her village. And then we go back and forth. Um, we see how Mache was rounded up. He was taken to the Krasny ghetto in 1942. Um, his, his shtetl of Horodok was destroyed. And the men were forced into labor for the Nazis, but he was resolved to not die. Um, he's given this presentation and it's very forceful and powerful. So we wanted to evince that as much as possible in this artwork. Then we go to Malka and she talks about how she was separated from her family, from first from her mother, then from her father and brother. Uh, and then she ended up at a women's labor camp uh, as one among millions. Now, 
in the course of this story, I had to do a lot of research as all of our artists do to determine how to draw these things. I did not actually have photos for a lot of this to go by. The photo you saw of them earlier was the only photo that I had to go by with them. And uh, one of the strengths of using comic book creators and telling these stories in the form of comics is you have the, you have the abilities of the artists at your disposal to essentially fill in the gaps. Uh, and it's something that Fritz Ottenheimer talked about before, how you know, because they didn't just have cameras and, and equipment to record this at the time, we can essentially go back and recreate it as much as possible. Um, and it's an awesome responsibility. So we go back to Mache's story. Um, he talks about how there were partisan fighters living in nearby forests and what was required for you to join them. Usually you had to bring weapons. Uh, so you'd be an asset rather than a burden. We'd show some of the weapons that had been kept uh, in the ghetto where he was at, they were in a specific warehouse and they had been dismantled, but they he, they were from time to time able to smuggle some of those dismantled weapons into the ghetto, where, excuse me, out of the ghetto where then the weapons were rebuilt. Uh, there was a woman in the ghetto who knew the location of a regional group of partisans, but she wanted to be taken out with her children. That was the only way she was going to tell them where they were at. So Mache took the woman and her children uh, and let an escape out of the ghetto one night. And this is depicting that. As the text says there, they walked all night uh, into the next morning and they walked out of the forest. Uh, as they cleared the forest, he looked at the sky. A lot of this also, I was told by the writer as he was in development of the script. So I was formulating a lot of this imagery even as before I actually got a chance to render it fully from his script. But he looked at the sky uh, and he knew even though he was free from, from the ghetto Krasny, he was not free from his responsibility. In other words, there was still more work for him to do. Malka, meanwhile, at her camp uh, was with the women and at one night they heard a cry, a child's cry out of nowhere. So they got up and they looked and they discovered a little boy and they never were able to determine exactly how the boy got there. But the women found him and they decided to keep him and hide him in secret and protect him. His name was David. He was about two and a half years old, and he stayed with the women in Barrack 13. So he gave them measures of hope in a very desolate and hopeless environment. Um, and they were able to keep him hidden for quite some time, days, months, years, they said. And then eventually a day came when their camp was inspected, and the commandant of the camp, whose name was Stiglitz, he discovered David and he pulled him out. So this is all historically accurate. This is what this is the story as it was related by Malka. Um, the women were made to stand at attention. Uh, Stiglitz dragged the boy out. He offered to take the boy for a ride, which as far as they knew, that just meant that was a death sentence. So he put the boy on his bicycle. The women were made to continue standing at attention and Stiglitz walked off with David on his bicycle. Uh, so it took a little back and forth with the writer for me to depict, like to determine how to depict this sequence, because this is where, this is this, I think the most hopeless sequence in the whole story. So I wanted to convey time passing. You see the sun moving across the sky. You see the shadows deepening because we don't know how long they were there, but they were there for quite some time. Um, but then she says they remembered seeing the impossible. So we see the women reacting we see the wheels of the bike in Stiglitz's feet, so he's returning to them. And then we re-encounter him with David. So David was still alive. For whatever reason, he was spared. The women obviously were very happy and very moved. And, and uh, as recounted by Malka, David's eyes were watching the sky as if he'd seen a miracle. But she'd also seen a miracle. This sequence when I was drawing it was the most powerful one for me. Uh, it was when I was drawing this that I realized the responsibility that we were taking on with Hutzpah, what we were trying to communicate to others. Uh, for the first time while I was ever drawing a sequence, my hand started to shake. I had to recompose myself. Uh, and I actually showed this to my girlfriend a couple days afterwards. She knew what this project was about and what I was doing. And I had the artwork laid out on my table. It didn't have any words or anything, just the actual sequence of events. And she got very quiet and I looked and noticed that she was crying at this sequence. And that's where I knew that this was going to work, that this, that the whole project was going to work the way we wanted it to, because we wanted people to connect with the humanity inherent in these stories. 
So to continue, uh, we go back to Mache, and he talks more about the partisan group who he joined, the Mistitel, which is a Russian word for revengers. Uh, the way the words are depicted there was meant to mimic traditional comics. There are a lot of things that were done visually throughout these stories that are meant to mimic traditional comic storytelling, including superhero stories. And this was one of them, this sequence. Uh, he talks about how his partisan unit lived deep in the woods. Uh, and from where they were at, they launched missions against the Germans. So you see a collage of imagery depicting what they did, uh, you know, setting bombs and derailing trains, uh, getting, you know, survival packages that were sent for them. Uh, he talked about a farmer named Kowarski who helped him get a message back to his family so he could mess, he could save his family from the ghetto. So uh, that farmer did clandestine missions. He got that message back to Mache's family, told them to be ready the next time he contacted them so he could get them out of the ghetto. And he was mostly successful. He was able to rescue Mache's mother, brother, and sister. But his father stayed behind because uh, Mache's sister, one of his sisters, was suffering from typhoid. And unfortunately, his father and sister perished in the ghetto when it was annihilated in 1943. And I chose to come back to from Moshe in the present to frame that sequence and that what that obviously would mean to him in his adulthood and beyond the Holocaust. Uh, he talks more about living outdoors with the partisans for two years. Uh, in the swamps and the forests and going deeper and deeper. So we just de depict some of that. Uh, he talked about having to rest and leaning against trees and, and learning to sleep while you walked, if you can imagine that. That one was a challenge. I had to figure out like how to draw that. And that's that that was what I came up with there. Uh, we sh they strained muddy water through cloth so they could drink it. They ate whatever they could forage. So it was needless to say it was a very rough time for them uh, as they were for forced closer to the front. In the winter of 1944 into 1945, uh, they joined the Red Army, the Russian Army, on the Baltic Front. So there is some imagery there because comics are a medium of economy. You do have to compress a lot of your storytelling. Um, together, this story on the printed page is eight pages long. So we didn't have a lot of room to talk. But through this imagery, this actually that I thought that that summed that up. The next, uh, his group, they met with the U.S. Army near Hamburg in May of 1945. Uh, that soldier depicted right there is a representation of the writer Wayne Wise's father who was in the same region at the same time. So they did not actually meet, but we wanted to actually give a face to that soldier in that time. And that made all the sense in the world. So just so you know, and then that was the end of the war. So we have the gun dismantled in, in a symbolic gesture. That was the end of the war for Mache. He left the unit and he went back to his life. Um, Malka, meanwhile, was liberated from her camp a few months later, and she and David were able to leave. So she left with him. Uh, they lived in abandoned apartments for a while, and then eventually she met an older Russian man who worked for the Russian army named Isidore. Uh, he was, she wasn't able to leave with him, but he was able to help find a way for her to leave. So he later sent a note to her with another Jew, with another Jewish soldier telling her that she could go with the man. She and her friend Rosa left. Uh, they traveled with the Russian soldiers. They stopped at a barn later on. They were still very mistrustful of, these, of their situation and soldiers just because of their experience for obvious reasons. Uh, but they were encouraged to come into the barn and to not stay in the, in, the, in the truck all night, which eventually they did. And eventually they also fell asleep. When they woke up, they were covered by a comforter uh, and they came out in the morning and they were given food. Uh, they were greeted warmly. And that's when they began to reintegrate themselves into the world. So as she put it, a tiny belief in human kindness dead for so long began to spark again. So this last group of sequences, this comes from the last page of the story. So this details how they got together. So there was no home for them to return to. So they met a displaced person's camp in Linz, Austria. Uh, Moshe came to the United States. He worked in real estate management. Uh, Malka got her teaching license. She went to our teaching certificate. She taught in Israel. Another one of our survivors they found out years later had actually been one of the students that she taught in Israel afterwards. So, you know, it, it's ultimately, I guess it's a small world. Uh, yes, yeah, so she earned her certificate in ch early childhood education, maintained her interest in that. Uh, the two of them 
uh, he joined her in Israel where they were married in 1952. Uh, they moved together to the States and they began a new life in New York City. Eventually they moved here to Pittsburgh in 1993 where they stayed and active in the Jewish community and beyond telling their stories uh, for the community. So this was meant to depict that. So you could see that that's actually what they did. And then we end the story with direct quotes from our subject. So hatred was the root of the Holocaust. Hatred makes you blind. To me, the greatest miracle is that I do not hate. I listen to good deeds and find good people. Good deeds are healing. And we felt like you can't end on a better note than that. So this story meant a lot to us. Um, all the stories meant, mean a lot to us. Uh, because it allowed us to obviously to convey something really powerful and to continue the message of what they themselves have been teaching and talking about for so long. I did eventually get to meet Mache afterwards. And I, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, I'm a huge Superman fan. That's what got me into comic books. I always tell people when I met Mache in person for the first time, it was much like meeting Superman in real life because knowing that he had been through these experiences and that I had gotten the chance to help relay them and to uh, preserve his stories, that meant a lot to me personally. So a proper application of comic books led by a knowledgeable instructor can support a range of study areas as mentioned before, including history, language arts and writing, visual arts, social studies and journalism. So there's a lot of ways that one can use comic books, graphic prose in classrooms. Uh, or any combination of these ways. I'm gonna share with you a little bit now of some how some of our educators have used Butz Pow in their classrooms with some of the materials that they've given us. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So what you're looking at right now are directions for, I guess, the, the, well, the directions on the left are for, uh, for, for people who would get these questions. So, and you got the answer key that uh, educators would use for their students. So they are asked to read stories from Hood's Pal, and then they are asked to give responses to certain questions in relation to the subjects of the stories. So, and this is helped, uh, excuse me, this is meant to help foster critical thinking skills within the context of the theme of resilience. Now, other themes used in some of these questions focus on resistance and identity. Um, but right here, you see the first question asks, how did Mache Barron show resilience during World War II? And then we have four answers and students could give any one of these answers or more, but this gives you a means of assessing, did they actually understand the material? Were they able to use their critical thinking skills to determine how Mache showed resistance during World War II? He follows this up with the same question now as applied to Malka Barron. How did she show resilience during World War II? And here are again, four more answers that apply specifically to Malka in the story. Malka did not give up hope on the camps, helped to keep a child alive while in the camp, became a teacher after the war and so on. So this is one method that can be utilized. And I've read answers that students have given. And again, when properly applied, they students do pick up on these materials like they do understand what is happening in the story so you can expect to see these answers given uh, another approach that is used takes more of an essay approach uh, and then a, and so in this approach a series of questions each of them requiring short essay responses is given uh, which effectively step the student through a reflection on the literary material so, and as you can see, it says right there, this set of questions pertains to the three. Now, at the time when this was given to me, we only had three comics, which is why it says pertains to the three Hoodspow comics that you've read. Please answer each question fully and refer to specific elements that you remember about the comic book. So, of all the stories in the three Hoodspow books, which survivor story were you most affected by and why? What moments stand out to you as being the most heroic in the three books? Why do you consider these moments to be heroic? What is the most impressive part of the writing of the comic book? And then after that, what did you enjoy about the artwork of the comic book? This particular educator draws a distinction between the writing and the artwork, which is, it is, I think it's important and it's fascinating because 
you can often glean different things from both elements of the storytelling. And I, I, I personally always like when I see educators who focus on that, who get their students to think about that component. You know, they have more to work with than they would in just a straight prose narrative. Um, here are a few more questions that she also has given them. Uh, the Hutzpah stories are brief, so they don't include all of the details of the survivor stories. Are there any stories that you have more questions about? And they often do come up with additional questions, and I have fielded them both in person and in writing. And often students are very, very invested in what they encounter. One of the strengths of utilizing comic books, graphic prose, in classroom settings is it is an immediately engaging medium, meaning unlike a book, and I'm not saying that one should not use books, but unlike a book, because there are also visuals present, it is immediately engaging. You automatically are involved in what is going on. It is hard to look away from a comic book. And it's especially hard to look away from a comic book that is telling a specific story to you, the reader. I have watched this time and again happen. It is a powerful tool. And the, the, the responses that it elicits from students at times can be surprising in its depth and its empathy. So I like both of these means of following through with students, but there are other means as well. So we also offer, in addition to the four comic books, a Hutzpah Teacher's Resource Guide. So this guide, I, I love this and I, I love talking about it. So it contains a lot of material. Um, there are curriculum guides. So there's materials that teachers can actively just go into and pull lessons out of. Uh, there's a glossary of terms. There's an appendix. Uh, there's additional information about both the Holocaust and com using comics as a learning tool. Uh, it is a fantastic resource. I actually keep a copy of this nearby when we're working on producing Hood's Pal in case I just need to reference it because, you know, I don't, I don't actively retain all of the information. There is so much information about the Holocaust. And I recognize from my own experience, it is an intimidating subject to learn about because there is so much information. So I always like to keep references handy as a reference, as a resource. This book really works well for me. I think one could use the Hoods Pal Teachers Resource Guide along with other materials, other books and publications and other works. It really works very, very well. Um, and it's also the handiwork of my coworker, Jackie, largely the handwork of my coworker, Jackie Reese. So a lot of time, a lot of work and a lot of effort went into that. And I thank her and my team at the Holocaust Center, because as I said, all these books are vetted by our entire team to make sure they are all historically accurate and clear in their narratives. So I will now talk to you about another part of this that I love, which is the interaction with the public, um, specifically with students. So Hutzpah often acts as a bridge with our audiences at the Holocaust Center, which helps to engage them with our other programming. So oftentimes we will either have students come to this, this Holocaust Center or we have facilitated having survivors or their families or important speakers visit the uh, students where they are at as well. Now this last year, of course, because of the pandemic, we have been closed. We have not been able to do that in person, but we've been doing a lot of this online. These photos that you're looking at now were actually taken. At, this one was taken at the Holocaust Center. That is sur local survivor Irene Skolnick speaking to a group, group of high school students that we were brought in. Like I said, we have also facilitated getting survivors to schools doing the same thing. So this is a field trip with survivor Sam Gottesman from 2019. I was at this one, this was this this event, this was very powerful and the students received Mr. Gottesman very warmly. He spoke often of his story and it was a very moving experience. Um, we also introduce students to our creative participants with Hood's Pals. So the writers and artists who produce the work um, we, we, they are allowed to speak at various programs with audiences. Uh, this gives an opportunity for the youth audiences to, to see the work that goes into relating these community stories as produced by creatives within the community. So the, letting them know these stories weren't produced and it's not magic. These are people that work and live right next to them producing it. So that is local writer Disha Filyaw attending a uh, uh, program with a group called Gwen's Girls here locally. 
This is another one of our creators, Rachel Masalamani. Uh, this group that she's working with is called Jada House. This photo is from 2018. Uh, the goal here is with this is to demonstrate that Hutzpah's stories don't exist in a vacuum, and they have resonance far beyond the Jewish community. I think it's very important for anyone who interacts with these stories to understand that these are not just Jewish stories, while they come from the Jewish community and the Jewish experience, these are, they contain lessons that everybody must learn. And it, I think it's easier for that to be, that point to be made when you see different faces behind the telling of these stories. So despite historical inaccuracy, students can be empowered through the use of comics. Comics are for everyone. There are other comics out there that address similar subject matter, which I could talk to you about. Um, I am partial to Hoots Pal because I love what we do and I love the way we do it. This is from an event that we had at a local high school, Shaler High School. Uh, these are three of the students there that helped us with the event, helped us to distribute Hoots Pal to some of the attendees. They, were, they had already read it. They were very enthusiastic about it. They loved the material. They told us that what we were doing really mattered and it helped them a lot. And as much as I, as, I love this and I've had so many positive encounters. There have been times, especially earlier on with the project, where I wasn't quite sure if it was really working, if it was connecting to who it was intended to, which is predominantly students. We mostly want students to really get this and engage with it. Although if the general public does as well, that's great. It's a work I think that has appeal to the general public. But there have been times where I've wondered about Hoods Pal's ability to actually connect with audiences. And then this happened. So this photo was taken a couple of years ago. Uh, a, my, my team from work went to a local baseball game as just a, a, an activity just from work. And as we were leaving the, the stadium, there was a group of kids nearby who had just attended the game as well. And they started calling out to me. So I had actually visited this group of kids just a couple weeks prior and talked to them about Hoods Pal. And because they're teenagers, you don't always know if your work and what you do and what you're talking about is connecting with teenagers. But in this instance, they were so overjoyed to see me that they called out to me. We have this photo, so I know that this actually happened. This was, I didn't just imagine it. Uh, and they really did respond to the material and to the presentation of the material. Not long after this, just I think within a few weeks of this, we actually brought them to the Holocaust Center and we actually closed the loop. You know, we introduced them to these stories in their environment and then we were able to bring them comfortably into our environment where we continued to talk about these stories. Years ago with the publication of his book, what Dr. Frederick Wordham missed by focusing on the perceived negative aspects of comics were the following equations. Words plus pictures equals engagement. Words plus pictures plus talent, that equals beautiful art. Words plus pictures plus talent plus positive social intent, that equals transformation. I have watched it with my own eyes and I encourage anybody out there who's able to help foster some of that to do so and encourage you to explore Hoots Pal and our project and our work to make that happen where you're at. Because now this is meant to be in all of your hands. And so if you are an educator or you know an educator or you know students or anybody, this is a work that's meant to be out there for them to use. So on the screen right now, this is my contact information at the Holocaust Center. Again, my name is Marcel Lamont Walker. I am the Hoots Pal Project Coordinator. Uh, that's my email address. Uh, you can also visit our website, Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. It's hcofpgh.org. We can make this information available to you again after the presentation. I am going to stick around for a bit in case any of you have any questions or anything you'd like to ask me. But I would mostly, I, right now, I would like to say thank you. I want to say thank you to the National Library of Israel for the opportunity to, to have this discussion. I want to thank any and all educators in attendance today for the work that you do every day, because I know educators, you are very put upon, and I have been in classrooms, and I have taught kids myself, and I know it is work. So I thank you for that work. And I just want to thank everybody here today for your interest in and engagement with this subject and for taking time out of your day to allow me to talk with you for a little bit. So 
again, thank you very, very much. And thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Marcel Walker. Uh, there are many, many compliments in the chat room. Uh, I will, I'll send you the transcript so you can read them uh, yourself. I just want to read one out by Janet. She wrote, very interesting. I teach about the Shoah through poetry. And yes, comic book are literature. Comic books are literature. Thank you, Marcel, for all you do. Um, and there are questions. So the first question will be, um, other than the association with heroes and superheroes and the natural engagement of juveniles, what are the other advantages of using the comic book media as opposed to others? Also, vice versa, other than the opinion of them being for juvenile audience, what are the other disadvantages? So there's a question for you. So, <laughs> well, as I said, the, the immediacy of comics, I think, is one of their primary strengths. Um, unlike other, I'm going to say, art forms or means of communication, there's very little, if any, pretense about comics. Like, it's really immediate, and what you see is what you get. Um, with most other means of communication, you have to be, you have to kind of, let's say, let's say literature, let's say just straight prose. You have to read for a while to like to determine what is the content of what you're reading. You know, so you don't just automatically know just by looking at words what, what you are going to be told. With comics, you kind of can get a sense of what you've got right in front of you. Um, and, and with other forms of media, I'm going to say television or even theater, where stories and narratives are unfolding in something closer to real time. One, those are, I'm going to say, passive mediums to a degree, like the narratives unfold and you watch them unfold. It doesn't really necessarily require anything of you as the audience necessarily. And, and, and I'm speaking in very general terms, of course, because I don't want to talk up on one form of communication or media and down on any other. Um, but with comics, I feel like those are that's a medium where you're asking your audience to meet you halfway uh, for, to get the most out of them. You know, the best comics are doing that. You know, you can't dumb down your material, but you have to simplify and make things clear. And you as a, and as a reader, you have to kind of do the work. You have to actually read the work. You have to look at the interaction between words and images. You know, you literally have to turn the pages. And that doesn't really sound like that's much interaction, but it is. And even the act of when you turn the page affects how you process the story. I'd say the single biggest disadvantage to using comics is the preconceptions that still linger about what comics are and who their audiences are. It, 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 it's, it's significant. Now that has eroded and changed over time. There, it is less of a challenge to use comics for educational applications and in educational settings than it used to be. Um, when, I was, when I was, I'm gonna say about 13, 14 years old, and I already knew I wanted to make comics at that time as, a, as my profession, like when I grew up. I was encouraged by a lot of people, but I was actively discouraged by a lot of people from pursuing that as a, as a vocation. I understand in retrospect why I was discouraged, but it didn't make life any easier. Like it, it, the, the, the idea that this was not something that was gonna be fulfilling for adults to pursue was very strong then, far less so now. Uh, there are so many different comics that cover so much of, of a range of backgrounds and stories and things. If one wants to make a vocation of making comics, writing or drawing or doing both, I think the pathways are far more open and the stories that you are uh, encouraged to tell are much more open, but that stigma still is there. So that's the single biggest challenge as a creative. And I think if you're to use comic, you also have to overcome some barriers as well. That resistance to using this media to, to, uh, to work with, with students. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. The next question is, um, what are the challenges of, of depicting these dark yet very real stories in this media? So there's a number of challenges, um, and I just saw, I, just, I have the chat open on the side here. I saw somebody ask for my contact information. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'll put that in the, in the chat as well, and that will be distributed as well to everybody. Also, if you look me up online, 
and you see my name there, Marcel Lamont Walker, I am very easy to find, just so you know. So when you type my name in online, you will get a lot of places where you can contact me. You can always contact me through the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, as well as the rest of our creative team. Um, <laughs> and just so I'm, could you repeat that question just for me? I just want to make sure I answer it correctly. Absolutely. Um, so what are the challenges of depicting these dark yet very real stories in this media? Yes. So <clears throat> for me, and I think my experience is mirror that of other creators who worked, who have worked on Hutzpah and probably people who have worked on similar materials. You have a challenge of doing right by the people whose stories you are telling, because that never, ever leaves my mind when I am approaching a story as, a, as an artist and as a writer. I should point out in the second volume of Hutzpah, um, I actually wrote Andrew the story that I worked on, which was that of Irena Sendler, uh, who was a Polish social worker who helped rescue approximately 2,500 children from the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, that, that story resonated with me. I was compelled to tell it, but it was a very daunting thing to do because it's, you, re, you realize that this is a real person who may be alive or was alive and you want to do right by that story. You want to make sure that anybody who reads it is getting out of it what they're supposed to get out of it. You wanna make sure you're preserving it in the right way so that people get the lesson out of it that they should. So, I mean, there's always the challenge of, uh, of, of, of making sure that things are correct, of clarity. That's, for me, that's really big. So in my capacity as Hutzpah project coordinator, I'm the editor of these books now. So in between volume two and volume three, I was actually brought on staff at the Holocaust Center and it became my responsibility. And so when we produce new issues, I work very closely with the writers and artists and the staff to make sure that everything is going the way it should. And every everybody takes it seriously, but you have to kind of also, that's a, that's a big challenge with these stories. And you're right, they are dark at times. Making sure that everything falls into place correctly, that everybody's working together the way they should. And also we don't shy away from the more mature themes of the stories. You know, we don't, we don't, really sugarcoated, but what we do is we actively are working to not traumatize the people who are reading the stories in retelling the stories. That's very important to us because we are working in such a way that we don't, you don't, we don't believe that you have to traumatize somebody to get them to learn. And actually, if, if you're putting work out there that could traumatize somebody, you're actually working against your end goal of educating them. So how do you tell something and keep it true to what it is, but also, you know, not, not necessarily put out things out there that you shouldn't. And then the other part of that is we, we, we've had many discussions, both the writers and the staff and the, those of us behind the scenes. To some extent, if you are putting, if you are, if you are taking someone's traumatic event, something that happened in their lives that was, you know, that affected them, and you put that out there in the wrong way, you run the risk of re-traumatizing the person in some way, shape or form, or their families, or those who are close to them, or their communities. You know, So you have to take that really, you have to take responsibility for that. And you have to think of how that's going to, what is it going to do out there in the world? Is there a more effective way to put that same information out there? Is there a different way to tell this story that is that not going to do more harm, but just informs and communicates the 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 gravity of what happened. And you know that sequence in Malka's story that I saw that 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 gave me pause, that made my girlfriend uh, cry. That demonstrated to me that we could do that. We could tell stories that would move people the way we want them to be moved, but without traumatizing, just with reaching them in, in their souls. You know, like you can, that's that's where it all takes place. That's where transformation takes place. You have to reach people in their souls. So, and I hope that that answers that question at least a little bit. Beautiful answer, thank you. Um, is chutzpah translated? Is it available in other languages other than English, maybe in Hebrew or something like that? 
Not yet, unfortunately. Um, we are working on the expansion of the Hutzpah project, uh, including potentially working with other publishers who can help us make that make it available in other languages. Um, to date, right now, it is like right now it is just available in English. But please stay plugged into us. Like please stay aware of us because we are we are continually working on this project to expand its audiences and its reach. So we have we are we are continually having discussions about things like this, specifically about uh, like the languages and 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 also as people make the requests, you know, that helps a lot as well. So if this is like a thing that you want to see translated into, into other languages, let us know because that goes a long way towards us being able to make that happen. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, so I'm gonna read you two comments. One is a question. Um, Nora asked, why did you name the comic Chutzpah or Chutzpah? <laughs> Chutzpah in Hebrew, uh, the word means uh, impotence. And in uh, and Shuli answered her with a comment, uh, chutzpah is, also means self-confidence and audacity. Do you have anything to say about that? Yes. So, <laughs> yes, thank you for asking that question. So it was that latter definition that was we were going by. I can tell you, so I was not in the room when this happened. When chutzpah was first created, like there was a steering committee. It was, it was a group of people that involved uh, some of the staff members at the Holocaust Center, some uh, participants with the Holocaust Center, funders, and uh, and creative participants. So Wayne Wise, the lead project writer, he was actually on that steering committee, and he and I are close friends. So I was aware of this from almost the beginning, even when I wasn't on that committee. And then rapidly, once I was asked to participate, I was there. But I was not in the room when this happened. I was working... I had already committed to working on the series under its original name. Its original name was The Upstanders. And I like that name because it sounded like, like a superhero team name, you know, which is what we were trying to evince, you know, the idea like the Avengers or the Justice League, something like that. So I, Upstanders sounded like that to me. He then told me one day that they had decided to change the name and it came about by something he just said in the middle of the meeting just to kind of lighten the mood and he just said the word pow and apparently it just everybody just stopped and paused and went that needs to be the name of this title of this book so yes that second definition when you're talking about like audacious self-confidence in my mind that's half of it that's half of the meaning of pow and the other part of that is the word pow is kind of synonymous with comic books and the energy of comic books it's a sound effect that you see you've seen in comics almost since their inception so the the definition that i've kind of reverse engineered is puts is the combination of audacious audacious self-confidence plus the energy of comics so that's that's how how it's come together for me and the nice thing about it is, and i gotta tell you when i first heard the title i didn't like it because i actually thought where did that come from why are they using that and then i over time i thought about it because it wasn't my decision at that point like they, they just chose it and they were using it but over time i came to see it was kind of a perfect title because there's literally no other title out there like it and when you hear hoots pow you know exactly what this book is so there's no confusing it with anything else out there and it kind of communicates what it is just by virtue of what it is. As soon as you see the, the, the logo, you have a sense of what the project is. So it's grown on me enormously. And, uh, and yeah, I couldn't have come up with it though. <laughs> so we have Wayne to thank for that one. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, so Aviva asked, does this material require a base knowledge via vis-a-vis -vis the Holocaust? Thank you this, for asking. Uh, base knowledge upon which to build. Thank you for asking that. I saw that question there, and so I was hoping that one was going to be asked. So, no, yes, no. I'm going to say mostly no, because from its inception, the, my approach to Hoots Pow has been if you just receive these comic books without any prior background or knowledge or anything about the Holocaust, you will learn. Um, if you get all four issues, you now at this point we have, I forget off the top of my head the exact count, but I think we have about 20 some stories that we have told to date. When you start reading all these stories, it starts really, it starts 
painting a picture of the Holocaust for you. It's a tapestry. And so I don't think you even necessarily need an instructor to understand that. The right instructor can help guide you through it, but you don't necessarily need it. Now, and when I entered into the Hutzpah project as a creator, I had what I'm going to say is a minimal background in Holocaust studies. Like, in other words, like I learned about it in school and I learned about it through general media, but I, I, I didn't really know it, know it. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that now, but it's true. So I had to learn as a creator and I've learned a lot. And we've created this book so that even if you just get the books by themselves, you'll learn a lot. Now, as an educator, it is definitely helpful to have some background, which is the thing, what I would recommend is utilizing that teacher's resource guide that I spoke about because it, it has a wealth of material and I don't, I don't necessarily think you need to read it and like remember everything in the resource guide because I don't think you can really do that either unless you're looking to become a Holocaust scholar, which you don't need to be. I, I guess I, one thing I would want to assure any educator who's never tackled this kind of material before is you do not need to be a Holocaust scholar to teach about the Holocaust every bit of knowledge that you gain will you will build upon and you will be surprised how how quickly you build upon your your base knowledge of it if you have the time and the ability to learn some ahead of time that will definitely help um, and in addition to that you know i would say you know seek out seek out stories of survivors you know like there's there's a host of uh, of, of transcripts and recorded interviews and things with survivors that one can encounter. Like if you engage with that, that will be very, very helpful. Um, and you know, that was critical in the early years of like formal Holocaust education in, in schools. Hutzpah now exists because as we know, our survivor community is, is, is shrinking. Um, there will be a time relatively soon where we won't have them directly anymore. We will still have families and people to continue those stories but they themselves won't be here to tell their stories. Hutzpah takes that responsibility very seriously. And we want to be able to continue their stories in ways they would want us to. But no, you don't have to, I don't think. If you have some information to start with, that will make it easier. That just makes it serves as a better launching point for, you know, for this as a mission. So I encourage you to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, Ellen asked, where can, uh, where can one uh, get a copy of Chutzpah and the teacher's guide? Maybe if you have that slide again, or if you could put the information into the chat room. Um, it uh, is, um, sure, yeah. I, let me see if I can pull it up. <laughs> it is currently available on Amazon, amazon.com. <clears throat> Excuse me, both, uh, both, let's see. So all four volumes of Chutzpah, the teacher's resource guide, and we have what is called Digital Hoods Pal. So Digital Hoods Pal, that's our really our most recent thing we did. We we took one or two stories from each issue and we basically made a, 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 an anthology of that. So if you if you have a, a Kindle or the Kindle app on a tablet or a phone or or your computer, you could uh, purchase that. You could purchase the uh, excuse me Digital Hoods Pal. And it will, it gives you like a, 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 a quick version of what the whole series is about. Um, it's, a, it's a great primer for the whole series. And I'm, as I have my computer up here right now and I'm gonna try and find it, but it's, it's very easy to find. Amazon's the easiest way to find it. Um, if you are in the States, in the United States, and for if you were to need just a specific volume. So for instance, I had an educator who reached out to me this past school year and he wanted, uh, he wanted like three dozen copies of volume two, just volume two. He didn't want the full set, just that, because that was working with the curriculum he had. And we were able to facilitate that as, a, as essentially as a special order through us. To date, we haven't had to do that out of the states, but just basically reach out. Let's, and if you, if you have any question, reach out to us and we'll see what we can facilitate to make happen, because we want to try and get this out to as many people as possible. Um, I will open microphones for people to say thank you personally uh, and maybe ask any more questions that I haven't read out of the chat room or if you haven't written any. Um, so thank you all for being here from all over the world. It's wonderful as always to see uh, so many countries represented here by uh, wonderful people. Uh, thank you for being here and Laila Tov from Jerusalem and then, uh, I'll see you in our next events.
thank you once uh, more, Marcel. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, I want to say I think your project's wonderful. I think it's amazing. I'm actually speaking from South Africa. And here, often comics are used because the population isn't that literate. So is that also an issue in America that the kids, so I wanted to ask, do the kids relate more to the art? Because I think the art would draw them in to such a difficult topic. That's my feeling. So what I have experienced, thank you for your question very much. And thank you for joining us. Um, it's been my experience that people are definitely engaged by the artwork. You know, that's a, a definite selling point with this series. You know, I'm, I, if I had to say, you know, what do I, what do I consider myself mostly to be vocationally? Well, it's, it's a visual artist. It's a comic book artist. That's what, when I was six, I decided I wanted to be, I was going to draw comic books for a living. And then as my own life progressed, you know, I got a little bit older and I realized if I'm drawing comic stories, I need stories to draw. So that's the reason why I started writing comics. And then it just continued on with that. And, and eventually I met other people who did it. But I think that the, the attraction to the visuals of comics is just a very primal instinct in all of us. Um, literacy is a challenge. Yes, it, it's a challenge here. Um, and, and also, and I, I, I guess a specific literary cha literacy challenge when it comes to comics is we're no longer living in a day and age where people just read comics. You know, when comics debuted and for years afterwards, everybody read comics. It was not, it was not uncommon to find them everywhere. You know, you found them in barber shops and, and salons and drugstores and just wherever you went. Nowadays, it's unusual. I was actually on a bus not too long ago where a, a teenage a teenager she was maybe 16 or 17 years old she saw me i had some comics i had literally just come from a comic shop so i was looking at the books i had and this young lady asked me is that a comic book and i realized she had never seen in person a comic book so oftentimes you're dealing with people Hutzpah is often the very first comic that people some people have read that's a challenge that can be a challenge so on the creative side, we try to take that into account. You know, we try to tell our stories in as straightforward a way as possible because we recognize some people have never read comics. And if we challenge the way that they read them, you know, some comics narratives aren't as clear, there's the potential of losing your audience. So creatively, we like to structure Hood's Pal so it's, as easy, it's, it's easy to digest. It's easy to figure it out if you've never done it before. But we still try to keep it as interesting as possible visually so it's not boring. Because I know when I was, also when I was a kid, I go by a lot of my instincts when I was little. And also I've taught kids comics. I've taught comics creation and, and I've, I've done, interacted with, I don't even know how many kids, thousands of kids, I guess. Um, it's very easy to lose their attention, especially if material is boring. Um, and I know I didn't really care for a lot of what I'll call educational comics when I was younger. So there's almost the trick of creating an educational comic that doesn't look or feel too much like an educational comic to keep their attention. I think we succeed, but it's the thing that we constantly have to keep in mind. You know, it's not, it, it won't necessarily work for everybody, but I think the right presentation helps make it work for a lot of people. And thanks for that question. <laughs> Brilliant answer. Thank you so much. And keep up the great work. Outstanding. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> anybody else have any questions i'm here with you for a little bit <laughs> i think michael has his hand up would you like to ask a question yes please thank you uh my name is michael i'm from uh northeast pennsylvania and uh i really appreciate the work uh, that you've done and the work of the uh, pittsburgh uh, center and uh, thank you so much for your talk today very interesting and um you know the graphics uh, prose, the narrative, the testimony, and and uh, the accounts of survivors are are wonderfully uh, presented. Like you said, it's a very um, it's a very accessible medium, and um, I think the the students um, I I teach older students, but I'm working on things for for uh, high school as well, and I think students can access it without any any uh, prior uh, knowledge. Um, I really like that you focus on resistance, resilience, and identity. Uh, I think that too much of Holocaust education has been 
um, not focused on the identity of survivor. My father and my and my grandparents were survivors, and my aunt, and uh, and their identities were not culturally represented in in the early stuff. It was all about trauma, mm -hmm. or about about the heroes of the war, and not about the survivors. That of course shifted in the seventies and eighties a lot. Uh, so now there's there's excellent representation, and, and what you've done is part of that. Um, I was wondering if you if you thought about since uh, you know first of all you can definitely um, provide this as an ESL tool, say to Polish children who are learning English, or 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 Latin American children in Latin American nations who are learning English. I know there's Holocaust centers in Latin America, um, and then and they could use this as a tool for learning English, and then a translated copy could be used for learning uh, Spanish or, or other languages. So the nice thing about a graphic um, uh, medium is, uh, you know, you put in simple language, you can focus on the story and then learn the language secondarily, uh, the way many of us learn French from uh, Tintin or, or Petit Prince or something like that. So. Uh, I like I like all all the all the um, aspects that that you've put into this, and um, I just want to hear you know kind of like could you could you mix some of the characters? Could you could you mix Irene Sendler with with other characters? Uh, the way you know the way you build hero teams for upstanders um, and, uh, and and work with others to to create kind of new narratives, um, the, uh, fictional new narratives even. Uh, the way it's been done with other other comics and superheroes. So, so Michael, thank you very much for all your comments, and and I want to first address uh, the idea, the 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 concept of identity and resilience. Identity, particularly when we created Hoots Pow, and I say we in the larger sense, because again, like I wasn't literally in the room when a lot of this started. Started rather pretty early on. Um, and so I want credit where credit's due. You know, there was there was a lot of uh, amazing thought and thoughtfulness that went into the creation of this this program right off the bat. And I know for a fact one of the one of the key one of the critical areas of thinking was the reframing of the Holocaust narrative in, in education. And when I say reframing, it's not about like necessarily replacing this or that or the other. Um, you know, Hoots Pow is not without its its criticism. It's been minimal. It's been really minimal to the degree that when it happens, I'm almost a little surprised. But but it, it's been there, and I've you know I try to I try to listen to it. We've always tried to listen to it. And when I say we, the, the thought was gave given to reframing that narrative. The idea was, you know, one of the people that was on that original steering committee said how their they had a relative who who when they were their family gatherings, for instance, and this topic would come up, you know, that relative's experiences, it prompted the family to view that person as a victim. And it was years in, you know, and we've heard from people who have read Hutzpah, who've had this, who've, who've said this has happened. Hutzpah facilitates people not just viewing this family member who's gone through this experience as, or, or anybody who's gone through the experience as a victim so much as a hero, you know, we're using hero and superhero, and it's in a larger metaphorical sense. You know, these are people who are who who engaged in the superheroic action of fighting for survival, their own and others. And I think that is very important to keep in mind. Um, you know, because not everybody in these stories survives. So it's so I, I'm a little careful with the language I use when I say that. You know, you're not just a hero because you survived. You're a hero when you took. The, you know, you made the effort to try to survive even because when you look at the landscape of what the Holocaust was, you know, and, and there are other things in history that compare to it, which is why I, I, I use Hutzpah and these narratives as a lens through which let's look at all these different areas in human history. If you are fighting to survive against, you know, greater forces that are, are trying to exterminate you, you know, you know, it, it is, a, it takes a super heroic effort. So we were very mindful of that. That was the goal. And um, you have a headache. Really bad. And uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that we we accomplished that goal. That was an active part of our goal. Now, as far as 
I'm going to say mi mixing and matching or, or, you know, teaming up characters because these are real people as opposed to fictional pe characters. We haven't done that. And I don't really see us doing anything along those lines. You know, we do try to respect that these are real narratives and real things that happened with real people. I can even say when, uh, when I was working on the first issue, I was not actually going to draw the first cover of the first issue. Somebody else had been chosen as the cover artist. If I didn't mention that before, I've drawn the covers of all four issues of Hutzpah. I always tell them they're not getting rid of me ever with that. But um, when, when I was working on that first cover, because that artist, first artist had to, had to leave for another project, and then I stepped in, I experimented you know like because i thought it, it seemed you know like i was excited to do it but then i realized the enormity of it and what it was this was going to be the introductory image for this project for most people who were going to engage with it so i had to really put some thought into it i uh i my preliminary images i actually showed to a number of my uh my jewish friends to get their input and insights and I, which was invaluable and eventually we ended up with the image that we have which is part homage to comics history it actually if you have the time to look it up it actually mirrors the copy of was it? i think it's uh uncanny x-men number one giant giant size x-men number one from this is from the early 1970s so it's kind of it borrows that composition but the application is meant to to show that these are real people because that was a key concern we didn't want people to think that we were creating a jewish superhero in the holocaust that's not you know what we were doing this wasn't about capes and tights and superpowers or anything like that but rather these real narratives and i think we struck a nice balance and uh you know the our goal now is to always make sure that our our intent is very clear so i don't see us really blurring those lines with any type of you know taking any liberties that way um but I can see the grouping of stories that can change. And that's the thing I would actually encourage educators to, to try, you know, like if you, this digital hoods pal, it, uh, it, it showed me that we can take stories and group them in different ways and, you know, and, and teach in ways that we hadn't necessarily thought of when we were first putting the books out. And I don't, I hesitate when I say fun, but that's, it's rewarding. Like there's a joy in seeing, that this book can be used in ways that even we hadn't thought of initially. So again, thank you very much for your questions and attendance and everything. I appreciate it. Does your organization intend to uh, tell any stories about the creation and the rebirth of the modern state of Israel? At the current time, no. We we have our hands full, at least as far as Hutzpah is concerned, because that's my full area of uh, of of expertise and where I'm just applied uh, it's it, it takes a lot of work it takes like it's it takes up all the time in the world to because uh, there's no other project like Hutzpah out there right now that is that does this work for a nonprofit entity and you know in an in a educational capacity and is also trying to reach general that I'm aware of if there is I would love to know about it and we can form a union but <laughs> right now there is as far as I'm aware there is not also as a nonprofit um, there are specific things that we are devoted to and specific things that we are not. Um, so, it, and this time, no, as far as I'm aware, there's no plans for that. But, uh, but we do, we do talk about a lot of community efforts and we are involved in a lot. We do try to, we, how, the way we try to put it is think globally, act locally. That's the way, that's the way we proceed with most of the work that we do. And we're at like 2.30, so I think I we probably have to... Do you have your hand up, Beth? Would you like to ask the question? Hi, uh, Marcel, good evening. Hi, Beth. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, oops. Do you hear me? Yes, I do. <laughs> oh. uh, no, thank you for this uh, rich, uh, incredibly rich um, lecture. From Israel, and I really liked Michael's idea very much um, about using Hood's power uh, as an ESL medium. Even here in Israel, as much as we are uh, content rich, perhaps there are a lot of children learning English as a second language, and I think it would be a brilliant 
uh, medium or a supplementary medium uh, over and above the traditional thing. And a few things I was thinking about while you were talking, the uh, kids today uh, completely inhabit a visual world. It's social media. And I think that the medium of the comic would be incredibly attractive because they are so visually orientated. I, I have no doubt that comics would turn kids on um, uh, instantly uh, because of the, the, the landscapes they inhabit um, today. Um, I loved your, your definition of, of what a hero means. Um, that just, it's not only the Schindlers and the Arena Sendlers, but the ordinary person fighting for survival uh, is a hero and it's a very humbling um, definition. And the third idea that came to my mind is, um, I'm wondering if any children, or it could be a tool after experiencing Hood's power for kids to then go and draw their own comics, to actually adopt this as a creative medium for, for their own voices. Um, do you ever see that happening? Yes. So, um, yes. Thank you. So thank you for your comments and your questions and your line of inquiry. And yes, um, I have encountered some educators who have used Hoods Pow and encouraged their students to tell their own narratives or narratives of people they know or in their community. And I love that because that is to me, that is the most natural extension of this project that you could have, you know, that is because that's exactly what we're doing. You know, we are taking this medium to do that and using its strengths, applying its strengths to do that. And, and I totally agree that if you were born, if you've been born in the last 20, 25 years, yes, you have just, you have just been assimilated completely into a very visual, overtly visual world as, as like your second man at times, maybe even your first language. Um, and I do think that that makes comics just a very natural means of communication for them because the best comics, and I was taught this when I was learning how to make comics, you almost don't even need the words. You don't need the words sometimes. The pictures will tell that story. So it it just facilitates that kind of learning. And I totally also agree that as a, a, a it, it's a language guide. One of the best compliments I ever got, this this actually precedes Hutzbau, but one of the best compliments I ever got was from a parent where they said to me after a session, because I had two of their children in my said son and daughter, and she said, your classes are the best language arts classes my kids have ever had. That was humbling. But it also, it meant a lot to me and it also meant a lot to me moving forward because that helped me to frame what I talk about when I talk about using comics because it is a language in, in, into and unto itself. And a thorough understanding of comics will facilitate understanding both, you know, prose like the, the written language language but also visual arts and and it, it facilitates literacy in all all respects and there is something very global about that um as well as with the subject matter itself you know that fighting for survival i mean there are people all over the planet fighting for survival this was a rough year you know for for all of us so i think it has hopefully humbled a lot of us to understand what it means to you know we to, to to need help sometimes to survive you know we all we're only going to make it if we're interrelated and that's for me an overarching message with Hutz Pow as well like we're only going to make it if we're trying to make it together and help one another do that because uh, that's a thread that you see running through these stories again and again and again and again um and kids are smart you know like kids pick up on a lot pick, kids often pick up on undercurrents that you don't see or think or think of. I, I, I've had teachers share some of their answers to some of these questions with me. And from time to time, I've been very moved by what, what they have picked up on. You know, sometimes you put things in there in, in your stories and you don't necessarily know if kids will get it, but you cannot underestimate kids' abilities and audience. I'll also just say audiences in general, because we have worked with, we work with, it's the Hutzpah is designed for middle school students and up that's kind of the sweet spot, middle school, but it's, just, you know, we've worked with grade school students, middle school students, high school students, college students, senior learners. That was actually wonderful. I worked with one group of senior learners and they, they all 
understand what this is about, but they take away different things. Um, and just on a personal note, I, I worked with one college class and they were reading a number of Paspal related, or excuse me, comics related narratives about the Holocaust. And they told me, I'm not just saying this because I just want to brag, but they actually told me that they preferred Hutzpau over Mouse. And I think the reason was, and again, this isn't a, against Mouse or anything, but I think they preferred Hutzpau because it is literal versus symbolic. You know, we're drawing people as people versus the symbols of people. And because these narratives are very short, they average six pages. And, you know, we have to, you have to make that story connect if you're doing a six page story to get in and out and convey that information. But I think it worked. Like they really, they just, they were hooked and they got it. So I think also the immediacy and the brevity of these stories makes them, you know, you can work with one Hutzpah story. You don't have to necessarily use all 20 plus narratives. You can work with one story and it, it can accomplish the same goal. So um, thank you for your, your comments and everything. You're all just, you just, make me uh, that much more gratified to be working on this project and that it is registering out there. So I, I really appreciate all of you. I also just realized when she said that good evening, like it's later where you're at than I am and I don't wanna keep you the rest of the night, um, but I am still available. If you need to reach out to me, uh, we, if you haven't gotten my information, you will. Uh, I, am, I am not hard to find and I really do hope you seek me out. And I really appreciate you taking your time this evening. Once again, thank you so, so much, Marcel Lamont Walker. Uh, thank you all once more for being here. Uh, good day, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Laila Tov from Jerusalem. Thank you all. Take care, everyone.